Hey everyone and welcome to AMC Mailbag, the all mailbag show here on AMC Movie News where all we do is take your questions. I'm Ashley Mova and if you've got a question that you want answered on air, you can send it over anytime to amcmovietalk at gmail.com. You could get it answered on Mailbag or Movie Talk and sitting with me to answer those questions is the editor-in-chief of AMC Movie News, John Campia. John, what's up? Hey, how you doing, Ashley? I'm good. I'm hanging in there. How are you doing? I'm having a great day so far and yeah. you know, I love... I love mailbag. Yeah. I love doing it's just it's just so cool. We, it's so much more relaxed. It we is. get to talk about different things that maybe we don't talk about on movie talk. It's just uh, I look forward to doing the show every week. It is. It's, it's pretty chill, you know. Let's yes. do this. <laughs> Alex Barra writes, "Hi AMC, I've been following you for a while now. You always say that a movie was well directed or not. But how do you know that? What makes a movie well directed? Thanks and keep up the great work." Well, like anything else in film, this is a subjective thing, mm-hmm. right? The, Different people will give you a different definition, a different answer for saying, what does it mean? Like, what tells you that this movie was well-directed mm-hmm. or not? So it's going to be different things. For me, there's several things I look for personally in a movie that, for me, makes it a well-directed or, or a poorly directed film. Number one, for me, the number one responsibility of a director is getting great performances out of their actors, making sure their actors are portraying the characters that they need them to portray so that they interact properly with all the other pieces in the film. Number one priority. Mm -hmm. So when you watch a movie where you see, like Fox Fox Catcher, um, where Channing Tatum gives the best performance of his career, Mm -hmm. Steve Carell gets an Oscar nomination, Mark Ruffalo gets an Oscar nomination. Mm -hmm. Yes, they're all good actors to start with, but obviously, they took them to a new level there. That's one of the first things to look for, is were the performances throughout the cast as good as those individual actors can be or better than they've ever been? And if that's so, that's a really great hallmark for how good the director is, because I think that's the first priority. Mm-hmm. The second priority is establishing the pace of the film. Pace is a, is a weird thing to nail down as far as what it was. And I'm not talking about whether a movie is fast-paced or slow-paced, but rather you feel a rhythm to the beats of the film as as the film progresses and moves from one stage to the next, whether that's slow or fast doesn't matter, but that it develops its own essential pace to itself and that you can feel the pace through it. Another thing is the narrative structure. Is the story told in such a way that it flows smoothly, that it's easy to watch and it sucks you in and it brings you along with it and it doesn't pull you out for unnecessary side stories and whatever, that when it does pull you into those side stories, it flows with the overall direction of the narrative so that the one coherent movie viewing experience tells the story, tells it effectively and moves. Mm-hmm. The fourth thing I look for is visuals of the film. I'm not talking about visual effects. I'm talking about the overall shot selection, how did they change, the color palette of the film, Mm -hmm. all these sorts of things that a director puts into it that obviously they work very closely with the cinematographer Mm -hmm. to get that figured out as well. So those are the things to me that I look for personally when looking at a film and I say to myself, was this well directed? If those things are there, to me it was a really well directed film. Your first point, this always confuses me with directors, um, that they need to get the best performance out of their actors. So, like, where is the line with an actor's job and a director's job? Because shouldn't it be the actor's job to make the character and develop it and work on their backstory and be that character? So how how does a director... You know, do that. How does what's the line? What, well, where's the line drawn? Here's here's a really important distinction. Is that, you know, they want to develop their back character. They want to figure out who their character is. Blah, blah blah. Yes, but you're figuring them out within the parameters that the director set for you, okay. because you, the actor, is an island. You know, they they've got their character that they need to, you know, perform and to bring to life and all that kind of stuff. But it's the director who has to sit back and understand how all the pieces fit together. Mm-hmm. How all the plot twists with this character and this side story and this secondary character and, blah, and how all these things fit together and knowing that for all of this to flow really well, I need this perform, I need this character to be like this and to bring this type of energy and to bring all that kind of stuff. I remember hearing um, we did earlier this week, we did uh, an Oscar nomination uh, reaction video mm-hmm. that was really long. But I think it was Alicia told this great story where the director of Foxcatcher had Steve Carell, like in trying to get Steve Carell to understand what this character was supposed to be. Mm -hmm. They got Steve Carell to write on a piece of paper that that he didn't show anybody, the most embarrassing secret about himself. (laughs) To write out the most embarrassing secret about himself, fold up that piece of paper and stick it in your pocket. Oh my gosh. And now always know 
that that humiliating, embarrassing thing about you <laughs> is right here. I love and that. And that sense of shame you feel while trying to project this, but at the same time feeling a sense of shame that you're trying to hide. And he said, if you ever do a bad job, we're taking that piece of paper out of the pocket <laughs> and we're going to show it to everybody. So... There's different directors that will have different that will have different techniques for bringing out those performances in those actors, but also a director has to be very careful because every actor is a very different animal. Mm -hmm. Like just because you interact with, say, Seth Rogen in one way, you figure out what works with Seth Rogen. How do I get the best out of Seth Rogen? That may be the totally wrong thing to do with Daniel Day Lewis. That might just take Daniel Day Lewis right. off or put like, turn him off or get him out of his zone or whatever. So a big part, it's almost like a coach of a sports team. The, mm -hmm. A big part of a director's role is to figure out their actors, get in tune with them, figure them out, and then understand how to draw the best out of them that he needs for that character, for he needs that role. And then trust the actor. Once, you've, once the director has properly communicated who this character is and what they need to be, now trust the actor to dig deep, find that character, and bring that character to life as best they can. Okay, that definitely makes sense. Jimmy writes, my question is, in 2015, Pixar is releasing two films, Inside Out and The Good Dinosaur. Whenever I watch a video from anyone talking about Pixar's 2015 lineup, everyone raves about Inside Out and how it could be Pixar's greatest movie yet. However, I never hear anyone talk about The Good Dinosaur. I do understand that there is no trailer. However, there is already concept art a poster for the movie, and even some cast members revealed. I was wondering, what are your thoughts on The Good Dinosaur and what it can do for Pixar, judging by its so far unpopularity? Thanks. Well, I mean, number one, you are correct. Nobody's really talking about The mm -hmm. Good Dinosaur at this point, and everybody is raving about Inside Out. Oh, yeah. I just two weeks ago sat down with a rep from Disney, and they are losing their minds over Inside Out. I mean, their, their words to me are basically... Just put Inside Out on the Oscar right now for the ne for the next Oscars. Just put their name on the trophy now. It's going to be the best animated film of the year. And there is there's a lot of feeling going around that it could be potential, mm -hmm. but potential is a weird thing. But still, <laughs> the potential is there that it could be the best Pixar film yet. I've seen about 15 minutes of the film, and I fell in love with what I saw. The rest of the movie might be crap, but just from the sample size I had, I was really in love. There's so much to be excited Where'd about. Did you see that lucky goose? I saw it at CinemaCon in uh, Las Ooh, Vegas. Lucky yes. you. The CinemaCon, you've heard hear us mention it. CinemaCon, for those you don't know, is this big conference for film exhibitors. So for all the movie theaters and movie theater chains, they all come together and the studios pitch them on all their movies coming out mm -hmm. and show us a lot of stuff. They bring out the stars to talk to you. Mm -hmm. and It's not open to the public. You have to register for it and, and be accepted. But they showed us about 15 minutes of it there. And I, I just fell in love with it. Now, as far as The Good Dinosaur... Don't read anything into the fact that nobody's talking about mm -hmm. it, and, and Disney's not even talking about it, for two reasons. Normally, when Pixar has a movie coming out relatively soon, they don't have another movie coming out before it. I, this is, I believe, the first time. Fact checker, Jonathan, you might want to look this up. I, I think this is the first time in history that Pixar's had two films coming out in the same year. Mm -hmm. So you might want to just look up a list of Pixar <laughs> films and see if two of them came out. But I think this is the first time they've ever had two films coming out in the same year. So... It's natural that if we're going to be talking about Pixar, we're going to talk about the Pixar films coming out in just a couple months. Mm -hmm. The one that has trailers out for it right now and the next one up to, blat, up to bat. The Good Dinosaur, it's, let's not forget, it's almost a year away. It's just under a year away. Like 10 months. So The Good Dinosaur is a long way off. Mm -hmm. Like big deal, we've seen concept art and a poster. Yeah. It's a long way off, and Pixar has another film they have a more immediate need to pump up and talk about and promote. Were you able to look up that stuff, John? Yeah, so 2015 is the first time that they've had two in one year, and it looks like 2017 that'll be repeated. But Yeah, I, th I believe I heard they're going to start oh. maybe trying to crank out two a year yeah. uh, coming up soon. But um, yeah, so honestly... Don't worry about it. We I, I don't know where the good dinosaur is going to be awesome or bad, but it's not it's not time yet to even start thinking about it. Let's get inside out in theaters and put behind us and then then let Pixar start worrying about really pushing and promoting oh my gosh. Uh, inside good out dinosaur. looks so good. I'm so I excited was for it. Cracking up at the trailer. Yeah, so me too. funny. What is your favorite Pixar film? Oh, you know what? I feel like I've I been know, asked this so question tough. a bunch it's of so times tough. and I feel like I've given a different answer every time. Um Ratatouille is up there. Mm -hmm. Wally, -E, Up, Toy Story Three, The Incredibles. I'm I'm gonna say Up right Ooh, now. I'm gonna say God. Up. To me, it's. 
the film is perfect. It's a perfect film. From there's no weaknesses. That is a film with no weakness. Everything in that film works. Um, so for now, I'll say up. But if you ask me tomorrow, I might say Incredibles. If you ask me the next time, I might say Ratatouille. I cry. In what about all you? These What's films? your favorite? Monsters Pixar. Inc. And I literally it's cry. It's so great. I didn't even say Pixar. Monsters Inc. I love Monsters Inc. It's so good, isn't it? Tearjerker for all of them. Like, why is that? I love it. <laughs> I wanted Boo. Oh, in Monsters I Universe. I wanted somehow, some I know, way. I know. You know what I wanted when when it was when the movie ends, mm -hmm. and you know they've been kicked out of the college, uh -huh, yeah. the university, and it, then it, it, then it runs you through the newspaper clipping showing they've grown. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I so badly wanted them it to then cut to the two of them mm -hmm. talking to Boo, yeah. getting ready to go to college. <laughs> And that was uh, the whole movie was actually them telling her the story. Aww. I'm getting <laughs> choked up just thinking about how how awesome and, and touching would I that have been. I hope they have another one. That'd be so much fun. I you do work too. They go with that, but. Um, Brett Garrison writes quick question Akiva Goldsman what the hell man how do you go from Batman and Robin to a beautiful mind and then Cinderella man to Winter's Tale he's a great writer but how can he be so inconsistent um, is he a great writer. You, you, I mean, you brought it up. First of all, the first thing I look for when I'm going to as ascribe the term great to somebody mm -hmm. is at least some kind of consistency, whether we're talking about a great football player, about a great actor, a great director, a great writer, whatever is, is there some consistency? Because if they're like this, I'll say, okay, on their best day, they have the potential to be great, and mm -hmm. but overall, are they great? Well, not if every other film they put out is terrible. Let's look at down some of the stuff he's done. He wrote Batman and Robin. Okay, that really, do we have to go into much more than that? Mm -hmm. That is one of the yeah. worst films ever. I, Robot, which, oddly enough, I didn't think was a bad movie. I thought it was okay. I thought I, Robot was all right. And I thought the script was kind of interesting. Mm -hmm. A big departure from the source material. But I actually thought it did okay. Uh, the Da Vinci Code which a lot of people loved. Uh, Angels and Demons, which a lot of people loved. I was not very big on The Da Vinci Code or Angels and Demons. I, I didn't think it was a very well adapted from the, from the original book. I didn't think that he did a great job. He wrote like almost 20 episodes of Fringe. And I really liked the Fringe TV series. I thought that was a really good series. But then he does Winter's Tale. <laughs> like, really? Winter's Tale? And then he, he's, he's written Insurgent. <laughs> which so we'll have to just kind of wait and see but then he wrote Cinderella Man which I thought it was a magnificent film so yeah you're right it's up and down it's up and down it's up and down now we'll see how Insurgent does then he's got another movie coming out called Rings that he's got coming out later in 2015 that I know very very little about if nothing at all so we'll see where it goes but hey the dude's working he clearly when he's on his A game he can turn out amazing material but I would like to know, like, exactly the way Brent put it in his email. What the hell? Mm -hmm. Like, we know you're capable of this. Why are you turning out, turning out so much of this when we know you can do this? So there's a I, I would be hesitant to work with the dude because mm -hmm. I just, I don't, I feel like I wouldn't know what I'd get out of him. Do you think he's trying to, like, push boundaries and try new things and it's just not working out? You know what? That could be the case. Um, I don't see how Batman and Robin is pushing the boundaries, mm -hmm. but... It could be the case, and if there, and if that's the case, there's some respect to be given to a guy who's trying to swing for the fences uh, and do something different and, and new. Winter's Tale just felt flat. It didn't feel like a guy tripping while trying to jump the furthest he's ever jumped. Mm -hmm. It didn't feel like that to me. It just felt flat. A couple of his films, the, the story has just felt flat to me. So it's frustrating when you get a writer like that. Because, like, for instance, if they were to announce tomorrow that he is going to write one of the new Star Wars movies, I wouldn't know whether to be excited or terrified. Because <laughs> it could be the greatest Star Wars ever. It could be the next Phantom Menace. I just don't know. Because he's like this. It's, it is frustrating. It's frustrating when you get people like that. Allen Erickson writes, Hey, sons and daughters of AMC. I absolutely love your show. Longtime viewer, first time writer. My question is about the movie The Prototype from writer-director Andrew... Andrew Will. It came out with a couple trailers between mid-2012 and early 2013. Like you guys say, all film is subjective, which I agree with, but I thought the trailers looked great and had potential to be a very cool movie. It also teased a 2013 release. We are now starting up 2015, and this movie has completely fallen off the map. Mm. Will this movie ever be released, or was it just a teaser that was never meant to be a full feature film? No, it was meant to be full feature film, but it's DOA. Uh, uh, 
that trailer came out. And I remember it because it was a very cool concept of a trailer because you had this robot in the hood and they pulls mm-hmm. in. It's a very cool robotic design too. Mm-hmm. It was a very almost 1960s sci-fi kind of design. It's almost the robot. scary. Yeah. yeah, and I think there was supposed to be a little bit of that. And so it was it was pretty interesting. There's a couple of recognizable faces um, in the thing. Actually, a guy who's uh, shows up once in a while in um, Game of Thrones. Uh, it looks like he's the lead guy in it. But that was years ago. Um, it, it, and honestly, I know a lot of people love the trailer. I thought it was looked great for a school project movie. It didn't look great for a Hollywood feature film wide release movie. It, it, it never felt like that to me. There were some very cool elements there, but it didn't feel like it was made by a professional filmmaker. Um, so I wasn't, while I was intrigued with the concept, I didn't exactly love the trailer. Mm-hmm. But this movie is, I believe it's DOA. Um, it's now 2015. If you go to its IMDb page, I, I believe they have still failed. They don't have a distributor for it. They don't have a distributor of record. And there's no company that's going to come along now, pick this thing up, and then invest 20 or $30 million in a marketing campaign to put it out mm-hmm. wide release. It's not going to happen. I suspect at some point, probably in the next year or two, you're going to find it on iTunes or something like that. So if you're really interested, there'll be a way to watch it. But I, I really don't think we're going to see it on the big screen. What would you say is the cutoff point where you can say X amount of years have passed. This movie is for sure not coming out. You know, it's weird to say because, I, I you know, Cabin in the Woods sat on the shelf for a while. Um, speaking of Chris Hemsworth, um, uh, not, what's uh, Red Dawn? Um, Red Dawn sat on the shelf for a number of years. I guess, it's, so it's not really the clock, it's the individual film. Right. You know, if it's a, a sci-fi kind of action film, well then the clock's really ticking because mm-hmm. as new stories come out and new mm-hmm. visual effects emerge and all right. that kind of stuff, suddenly now your film's getting old. Mm-hmm. Whereas a movie like Red Dawn, that could, that could have sat on the shelf for five years and then released it would have been fine. But I got a feeling if, if you know, two years sitting on the shelf, if you don't have a distributor, it's different then if you have a distributor who buys a distribution rights to your film and they decide now's not the time to release it we're going to wait and release mm-hmm. it that's different from it's been two years and we haven't been able yeah. to get a distributor like that's it's time to you know yeah. pack up your bag and go home makes sense Ethan Goldberg writes hey AMC Movie Talk big fan of the show I have a question for you with the recent bombs of some DreamWorks animation movies and the sort of kind of failure of How to Train Your Dragon 2 and Penguins of Madagascar do you think they need a new Shrek or something to get some of their street cred back well first of all with How to Train Your Dragon 2 the film made over 620 million dollars <laughs> um, that's not sort of failure that's like sort of awesome yeah. they they were very happy. Could, yeah. could it have done better? Sure. Yeah. I, maybe they even hoped for more than that. But at the end of the day, it made $620 million worldwide. Mm-hmm. They, yeah, no. That was a <laughs> smash hit. Big success. So they're very, very happy with that. Penguins of Madagascar 2. Uh, it, um, it, it is a film that I don't really, I don't think it lost the money. I don't, it certainly didn't bomb. Mm-hmm. I do agree. It didn't do the business they thought it was going to do and that they hoped it would do. But look, they've had some big hits. Like the Kung Fu Panda stuff has been good. Uh, the Croods did very, very well for them. Uh, they've got another Kung Fu Panda movie coming out. I would be very interested in seeing them take a, another swing at Shrek. I think it's been long enough. Mm-hmm. Um, they had kind of lost me by the time the last Shrek movie came out. I thought Shrek 2 is like one of my all-time favorite mm-hmm. animated films. It's just so funny, so charming. And even, uh, I didn't like three very much, but even four, I, I thought four started recapturing some of the magic. I think it's time. I think they could do another Shrek mm-hmm. film. Um, and because those characters are just so great and so much personality that you could do it. But no, I don't think they're in a position right now where they're desperate and they have to go back yeah. to something that they didn't want to go back to just to get back some street cred. They're doing okay. They're doing fine. What are the odds that they can get back? Because I think with Shrek, those voices are so crucial. Like I love, I think yeah. those voices fit so perfectly. What are the, you know, what are the chances that they're going to actually get back that cast? Well, Mike Myers is, is not exactly, Mike Myers isn't exactly doing four movies a yeah. year right now. So he would be easy. Um, Cameron Diaz is not exactly tearing it up right. at the box office. Look, we're talking about a very easy, go into the studio for about a week collect a big paycheck it's it's not that hard it just takes a week uh look all they gotta do look sometimes sometimes more sometimes less but remember they just got to go in into a sound booth and just read their lines yeah. i mean it's it's not like they have to go and be on set for four months mm-hmm. um eddie murphy same thing i i don't see him being super busy so 
this is actually a cast I don't think you'd have much trouble getting yeah. back. I, I don't mean that disparagingly. I don't mean right, that as an right. insult to those people whatsoever. I think they're magnificent. But I think the reality is I think their schedules would be open enough that yeah. they could book a little bit of time to collect a big paycheck and come in and do some voice work. I'd love to see it. Me too. Jenna Mitchell writes, Hey, everyone. Found your show a year ago, and I'm so happy I did. I recently watched Fury. Absolutely loved it. I know it's about the last days of World War II, but the characters are not actual people who went through the events portrayed in the film. So my question is, when do you think there will be a movie about September 11th that's centered around fictional characters? We've gotten movies like United 93, a great film, and World Trade Center, but they're all based on actual people. And we've gotten films like Extremely Loud and Incredibly Close, but they're not solely centered around what happened in slash around the Twin Towers and or the Pentagon. Do you think it's still too soon? No, I don't think it's too soon. I, I think, and I'm one of these people where I, I totally understand why for many people, the term too soon can apply. Mm -hmm. I totally get that and I want to respect that. Mm -hmm. I'm just saying for me personally, I think telling stories is important. And I, to me, there's no such thing as too soon. That's just for me. But in terms of do we want to be respectful to other people who this might hurt or affect or stuff like that, okay, yeah. With the September 11th stuff, no, we're way beyond it. Mm -hmm. So it's not too soon. But the problem you run into, the challenge you run into with a 9-11 film, uh, particularly around the actual events of 9 because you're saying not just, a, not just around it, but actually in the events, versus a World War II movie, is that a movie like Fury can take place anywhere in Europe. Mm -hmm. <laughs> you know, like the, the stage of World War II is so big and so vast, you can create tens, like, however many fictional characters you want to take place in a, a fictional events that has no effect on the overall scope and story of what World War II is. You just drop them in because it's so vast. Something like the events of 9-11 you're talking about at the Twin Towers or at the Pentagon, you're talking about a very small confined space. Mm -hmm. To make up fictional characters now, you're actually now treading on reality. Yeah. In a World War II thing where, every, where the, the map is so big, you can drop whatever characters you want in there. It makes no difference because this doesn't affect, unless you're doing, you know, Inglorious Bastards in which you're changing history. That's different. But you can drop in these characters and say they did this and this and this, but it has no impact on what the overall story of World War II was. You do that with something as confined as a 9-11 story. Now you're creating history. And I'm okay for creating false history in movies. Movies are not our textbooks. They're entertainment, and I'm fine with that. But, you know, if that's not what you want to do, if you still want to respect the history, then, then it becomes very difficult. It's almost impossible to do it. I, I don't see how you make a 9-11 movie that takes place in the heart of the events of 9-11 mm -hmm. with fictional characters doing fictional things without changing the narrative of what actually happened. Yeah. It, it's a very tall order. And don't you think it'd be kind of costly, too? Like a costly movie? Um... Not necessarily. I, I think, you know, when you look at the World Trade Center by, um, uh, oh, I'm looking at his face. Uh, who's the director of 4th of July? Who directed the World Trade Center? Um, who directed Platoon? Um, Oliver Stone. Oliver Stone, thank you. I can name every movie he's directed, but I couldn't remember <laughs> his name. Um, you know, the, the World Trade Center by Oliver Stone, is, that wasn't a super expensive movie. Um, and I actually think better than, than the credit it gets. I think it deserves a little bit more credit. It's not a great movie, but mm -hmm. it, it's not a, a bad movie either. Um, but so no, I think you'd probably do it for fairly, depending on what it was you're trying to shoot. Mm -hmm. But I, no, I don't think it would be that expensive of a film. We're ta we were talking about this um, movie coming out earlier this week on Movie Talk with uh, John Krasinski. Do you think yes. that's going to be, I mean, Michael Bay, don't you think that's going to be? Oh my uh, God, I'm so worried about that film. It's... <laughs> Okay, it's a movie about the events. It's called Thirteen Hours. It's about the movie, the events that happened in Benghazi, and mm -hmm. that, that whole thing about yeah. the the embassy coming under attack. And John Krasinski from the who plays Jim on The Office, and I love this guy. I hope he gets more opportunities. It's supposed to is now going to be the lead character, but I'm so worried about it because it's Michael Bay. Mm -hmm. And look, I am a Michael Bay defender. Like I think. Michael Bay, with the right kind of film, can turn out some really entertaining stuff. I liked Pain and Gain. Mm -hmm. I like Armageddon. I love The Rock. I like the first Transformers movie. But that's his wheelhouse. Dealing with something like Benghazi in the hands of Michael Bay, something don't feel right about it. Now, who knows? This could be Michael Bay's Picasso. 
I mean, maybe Michael Bay takes a movie like this that seems really weird for him to do and churns out a powerful film and suddenly we all think very differently mm-hmm. about Michael Bay. But at the outset, I just feel a little bit weird about it. <laughs> we'll see. Yeah, we'll see. <laughs> Marvin Eggman writes, what do you think of the out with the old and with the new mentality viewers seem to have when it comes to acting performances? I've noticed that when an actor is in a certain role, they are beloved, but when they get replaced, they are suddenly disregarded. An example of this is Edward Norton and Mark Ruffalo in the Bruce Banner role. When it was announced Norton was being replaced, almost everyone I heard from, whether from the internet or friends, were outraged and insisted that Norton was perfect as Banner, which I agree. But after the Avengers came out and Ruffalo pulled out a good performance, all I heard was how Norton was bland or <laughs> miscast. Are we fickle? Oh, you're damn right. <laughs> we, as audience fans, <laughs> as, as movie fans and audience members, we are a fickle bunch. We are absolutely. But you, your question kind of raises a point that I try to make all the time. The character is more important than the actor. I, I say that all. The character is more important than the actor. And I'm glad you brought up the Edward Norton thing because people forget very like a lot about how when it looked like Norton may not return, how much a lot of people complained. Mm-hmm. It's like it can only be Ed Norton. Mm-hmm. It's gotta be Ed Norton. Ed Norton brought life back to Bruce Banner. He did and I like Ed Norton as Bruce Banner. I think he did a great Bruce Bruce Banner, and I was wanting to see him come back too. But I get into these arguments with people that like, look, the character is bigger than the actor. If Robert Downey Jr left Iron Man, and I'm glad he's coming back. Mm -hmm. I am, I am glad. But I have said before that if he leaves, it's okay. As long as they get a good actor to come in and give a good performance to, we will now see them as Tony Stark. Mm -hmm. And everyone says, no, we won't. It can only be Robert Downey Jr. It's like, no, it can't. It's, we always think the one thing we've seen is the only thing that can be. And it's just not true. History has shown it over and over again. You know, uh, Dumbledore, the actor who played Dumbledore in, in, in um, the Harry Potter franchise, they replaced him. Now, great, it's because the actor died, but they still, they replaced with another actor who was great, and now we saw him as Dumbledore. Mm-hmm. They changed James Bonds. Uh, they changed Clarice in, in the um, uh, 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 Hannibal yeah, Lecter yeah. movies. You know, they, they you change actors as you go because you need to. I mean, in the Marvel films, they, they replaced, um, they put in Don Cheadle, right? You change actors, but the character is the most important thing, and then you move on. And had they gotten a bad actor who brought a bad performance into the Bruce Banner role, Mm -hmm. instead of Mark Ruffalo, Academy Award nominated Mark Ruffalo, by the way, uh, then you would have continued to hear a lot of people complaining about the fact that they got rid of Edward Norton. Understandably so. But they got a good actor who did a good job with Bruce Banner. And so we're not so worried about the fact that Edward Norton's Mm -hmm. not there anymore. And that just kind of highlights the fact, yeah, we're fickle, but the character's more important than the actor. And if you get a good actor to replace another actor, it'll work just fine. You just named so many characters that <laughs> I would think are iconic roles that no one can replace the original actor. Are there any iconic roles that you cannot see anyone else playing that role? Oh, my goodness. Uh, you know, I, I, I'm certain I have had this question before and I've said yes and I've mentioned one or two mm-hmm. characters. But just because I have a hard time seeing it doesn't mean yeah. that's the way it is, right? right? I mean... You'd think that you could never see another James Bond Mm -hmm. other than Sean Connery. And yet, now we have Daniel Craig, who, and this is up for debate, but to me, Daniel Craig is the best James Mm -hmm. Bond we've ever had. You know, uh, you you had these two James Bonds, I say this a lot, but you had these two iconic James Bond. You had Roger Moore and Sean Connery, and they both represented kind of a different James Bond. Mm -hmm. There was the suave, slick James Bond. There was the manly man's Mm -hmm. man James Bond. And then you get Daniel Craig, who is the amalgamation of both. He's a hybrid of both, mm-hmm. a perfect hybrid of both. And so people go, woo, when I say, <laughs> I actually think Daniel Craig is the best James Bond. We can sit back and hold on to the history and say, no, Sean Connery, that, that's fine. But for my money, Daniel Craig's the best James Bond we've ever had. That's no disrespect to Sean Connery. I love the Sean Connery James Bond, mm-hmm. love it. But Daniel Craig came in, proved there's not just one guy who can play this role. Mm-hmm. And uh, that's kind of the key. All right. Ahmed Almirfa writes, Hi, AMC, quick question. Who do you think will win an Oscar for Best Actor, Affleck or DiCaprio? Thanks. Oh, who will be the first? I, I love these questions, but who will be the first to win an Oscar? This person, this person. Uh, look, Ben Affleck, I have, I've been a Ben Affleck defender for a lot of years, ever since I saw him in Changing Lanes. Mm-hmm. Um, it was like, yeah, he was really good in, uh, what was the movie he wrote with uh, Matt Damon? Uh, uh, Goodwill Hunting. Goodwill Hunting, thank you. Uh, obviously, he was really good in Goodwill Hunting, but 
then he, he did some crap and I saw him in Changing Lanes and I'm like, wait a minute, this dude mm -hmm. can be an exceptional actor. And he, he continued to do some things of crap, but I've maintained, I actually think this guy's got it. And then we see him in The Town and he crushes it in The Town. Then we see him in Argo, wins best picture and he was great in that film. Mm -hmm. uh, now And then we saw him in Gone Girl. I thought he was fantastic in Gone Girl. And now he's gonna be Batman. Mm -hmm. But Leonardo DiCaprio's on another level. Leonardo DiCaprio, he is the best actor in the business who hasn't won an Academy Award. That, that's unfortunately his mantle right now. Uh, but he's still so young and is just getting better. That's the scary thing about Leonardo <laughs> DiCaprio is that Leonardo DiCaprio, you could make an art. He is in the conversation of best actors working today. He's not Daniel Day-Lewis, but he's in that conversation, right? But the scary thing about him is that he keeps getting better. Every movie we see him in, he's adding new dimensions to his game, right? It, and then we saw him in Wolf of Wall Street, where he showed us things he has not shown us before in a film. And it's just staggering. We have not seen where his ceiling is yet. So he is that elite level of actor where every time he's in a movie, mm -hmm. you can make the starting assumption, come Oscar season, he's gonna be nominated because it's Leonardo DiCaprio and he's just that damn good. So all due respect to Ben Affleck, mm -hmm. who I am a fan of and I have been a big defender of. No one supported, nobody supported the casting of Ben Affleck as Batman more than me. I have been the flag wearer, <laughs> waver. I have been the cheerleader for the Ben Affleck as Batman thing from moment one. In all due respect to Ben though, DiCaprio's on another level. And so I would be shocked. Hey, Ben Affleck might add one or two more directing or writing mm -hmm. Academy Awards to his mantle before Leo gets an acting award, but I'll be shocked if Ben gets an acting Academy Award before Leonardo DiCaprio. It's going to happen eventually. He's going yeah. to get one. So, uh, yeah, I have to say Leonardo DiCaprio. What do you think? If you had a guess between the two, which one would you I would with? say Leonardo DiCaprio. I, I almost want to feel bad for him not getting an Oscar yet, but he's then so I take many a step back and I'm like, wait a second, he's Leonardo DiCaprio. He's just he's fine. He's doing I okay. Don't need to feel bad for him. Yes, with the seven women on his arm exactly. and his private jet going around the world. He's surviving. Like, he, he's being, he's okay. No, don't worry about him. All right, guys, that's all the time we've got for today. Thanks so much for joining us today, guys. And just a reminder that there are a lot of great movies being shown in AMC Theaters today. So go ahead and head on over to www.amctheaters.com for all of your theaters, show times, and ticket information. And if you want a podcast version, check out the description box below and make sure to click that subscribe button. Thanks to the guys in the room, Jonathan and Dennis, and thanks to the guy answering your questions, Mr. John Campia. John, where can people find you online? You can find me on Facebook and Twitter and Trivia Crack at John Campia. <laughs> Trivia Crack? Trivia Crack. crack. I need to join. You guys can find me on Twitter and Instagram at Ashley Mova. And that's all for today. Thanks, guys, for watching. Bye.